Washington, D.C. is my home away from home. I've worked here for the better part of three decades as a founder entrepreneur, policy expert, and author. Probably the longest title. Um, everybody sort of shortened it to ONC for sanity. Mercif sake. Mercifully. Yeah, mercifully. I've learned leadership secrets from many healthcare executives who understand that Washington is the largest payer and regulator of healthcare. She said, well, because you'll never get a husband if you do that. <laughs> I began interviewing healthcare leaders many years ago because what better way to learn how they think, why they make it to the top, and how they remain there. Think about what was your most challenging engagement? Healthcare has been the most difficult problem. <laughs> what did you say? We'll talk about that later. He was expelled from high school, backpacked across Panama, and he's an industry leader in healthcare IT. Today, we are featuring Dr. John Glasser, an executive in residence at the Harvard Medical School. John served as the CIO for Partners Healthcare, now known as Mass General Brigham, for 22 years until he accepted the CEO position at Siemens Health Services. We discuss why he made the jump and the differences and similarities between leading an academic health system and a commercial company and between the CEO and CIO roles. We dive deep into the continuing evolution of health IT, such as limitations of interoperability, challenges of usability, and the future of AI and machine learning. John serves on multiple boards of directors and provided insights into governance. We touched on what makes exceptional board members and how to strike the balance between governance and management. For up and coming leaders, John advises that you understand who you are, what you believe in, and follow your instincts. Let that approach guide your career and your life. Well, good morning, John, and welcome. Thank you, Gary, it's a pleasure to be here. We're pleased to have you at this microphone. You've been a prominent and very successful leader throughout your career, couple of highlights were being the CIO at Partners, now known as Mass General Brigham, and being the CEO at uh, Siemens Health Services. So from the standpoint of the audience, we'd like to get to know you better and understand what's behind some of the decisions you've made. Why don't we kind of kick off at the beginning? So what was life like growing up for you, John? Oh, I think, Gary, my sort of youth was probably pretty typical of a whole lot of folks. I grew up in suburban uh, San Francisco Bay Area, the town of San Mateo. You know, I went to Catholic grammar school, Catholic high school, was a Boy Scout, an altar boy, junior achievement, you know, all the typical things you might see. Um, probably only two real unusual items. I spent a freshman year at a British boarding school. Uh, my father was a, a consultant at McKinsey. He was sent to Germany. My brother and I were dispatched to British boarding school for a year. I still have a cricket bat in the attic for reasons <laughs> that are unclear to me. Um, and the second was I was expelled from high school in the middle of my junior year. So those are other than that, it was a pretty typical, you know, uh, upbringing of someone born in 1955. Well, I have to jump in and ask the obvious question. So what happened to cause you to be expelled, John? <laughs> well, well, I went to a Catholic high school and um, my three colleagues and I wrote an underground newspaper, which was a little raunchy. <laughs> and I think we made two. It was well written, frankly. I still have a copy. of It, it was well written. Um, but we made the mistake of distributing it on the afternoon of parents night. So mom and dad came <laughs> down to the school and this. Oh, my goodness. The roof blew off. And my buddies and I were in front of a tribunal of priests the following morning, and one by each went through. My three friends did the mea culpa. If you're Catholic, you're the sort of Latin for our father, I'm sorry. But I got mad, uh, and I accused them of being sanctimonious and hypocritical, and I said the Catholic Church was a criminal organization. I just got mad. And so I didn't realize that I had crossed a line in there. So I was decapitated as a result of that conversation, and there you go. Uh, so, I, <laughs> so lessons learned about timing and lessons learned about uh, I probably could have handled that discussion a little bit better in retrospect. Well, I guess uh, lessons learned is the key. So what did the young John think about leadership? Well, I don't know that the young John really thought about that. I mean, the young John was, uh, you know, it, it sort of had purpose, but didn't have purpose. 
you know, for lots of things here. Uh, and I think a couple of things, you know, I'll just give you an example, Gary. <clears throat> you know, I wound up, uh, my first job out of college, I was a math major at Duke, uh, was at Pizza Hut. And my next job was in a salmon cannery in Alaska. And then from Alaska, I hitchhiked to Fairbanks, uh, from Fairbanks, Alaska to the Panama Canal through North Carolina. It took me six months. That is not a focused human being on a linear path to medical school or being a lawyer or whatever. So I don't really think I thought about it. I kind of, you know, accidental leadership is perhaps a better way to put it. Um, I also think, you know, frankly, and, you know, you know more about this than I do, uh, that leadership in a way is a, you know, people get into it um, almost secondarily. You know, they may have a desire to start a company or a desire to solve global warming, et cetera, and they're aggressive and they're focused and they become leaders along the way. But that's not what they started out to do. They started to start a company and or leaders. You go into a job, you happen to run a team, you do pretty well, you get moved up the ladder and you say, son of a gun, I really like this. And I'm actually pretty good at this. And you learn along the way. I think leadership is just this never ending series of experiences and things that shape you. Well, that's well said for sure. What about your parents? Do you think your leadership style mirrors at all uh, that of your parents? Yeah, I think directly and indirectly. You know, they were, I was lucky to have good genes. Uh, so, you know, reasonably intelligent. I was raised well uh, and educated and fed and avoid some of the horrific situations that people sometimes encounter in their home, et cetera. My father was a very successful consultant and very active professionally in sort of the professional societies. And I, you know, mimic that a lot in my own upbringing. My mother was very eccentric. Uh, and so she taught you to challenge and try to be unorthodox. So to give you an example, Gary, she spent the last 20 years of her life in a camper truck roaming around the Southwest. We actually never knew where she was at any moment in time. And that was just her style. Uh, and she, you know, passed on some of that to us. But so in a, in a, they shape you along the way, perhaps not as intentionally or as directly as you might imagine, but the shaping nonetheless. So what about healthcare, John? At what point did you either fall into healthcare or think that healthcare would be a good place for you? Well, I think falling is probably the better way to, it's a better uh, verb here. As I mentioned, uh, hitchhiked and uh, got to Panama and realized two things. One is I'm tired of hitchhiking. You know, six months is a long time to sleeping on pieces of cardboard in the back of shell stations. Um, and the other is I was actually madly in love, occurred to me, I'm actually madly in love with this woman who I had met in college. And I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to go back to Durham. She was still at Duke and I'm going to be with her and you know, been together for 47 years as a result of that. So I went back there for no other reason than to be with her, took the first job I was offered, which was as a programmer analyst at Research Triangle Institute. And at the time, they were doing a, the first federal study of healthcare quality and utilization. It had really been studied comprehensively before. And I was a programmer uh, designed to do Fortran-based analysis of the work they were doing. And I thought, Gary, this is pretty darn cool. You know, healthcare is really interesting. Uh, and, you know, I didn't want to be a Fortran programmer for the rest of my life, but this IT stuff is kind of interesting, too. So it was kind of wandering in, you know, based on seeing her and based on the first job I was offered. So you ended up at the University of Minnesota in a medical informatics program right. to get your PhD, which in those days, that was pretty early on to think about medical informatics and get a graduate degree, wasn't it? So you were blazing a path there yeah. to some degree. Well, it was early, that's for sure. Um, at Research Triangle Institute, after three years, I uh, realized that uh, healthcare I wanted to stay in, but I didn't want to write Fortran code for the rest of my life. Um, my stepmother was actually had a PhD in epidemiology. Ah. And she said, why don't you go get a PhD in biomedical informatics or medical informatics at the time? And I thought, well, shoot, why not? Uh, you know, it's, I'm not sure what I do with the PhD or why I get one, but it certainly seemed, you know, better than writing Fortran code. And at the time, Gary, there were three programs where you could actually get a title, you know, your degree read health informatics or something like that. You know, one was at Stanford, one was at UCSF, and one was at the University of Minnesota. And I said, well, I've lived in the Bay Area. Uh, it's time to go try a different part of the world. And so I wound up at the University of Minnesota, which had a great program and a variety of other things. Uh, plus, the, uh, you know, I got my uh, expenses, tuition, and some room, nominal room and board covered, you know, by them courtesy of the National Library of Medicine. So anyway, that's why I wound up in Minnesota. It was, there aren't, weren't many programs at the time. Right. Well, you traded down on the weather going from Duke <laughs> to Minnesota, but... <laughs> <laughs> I got to carry after growing up in North, in California and then eight years in North Carolina between college this and I got there I, I couldn't believe the settlers stopped I said well, you got to be kidding me this is so cold after one night we're, we're off to Salt Lake City we're off to Palm Springs or whatever 
And then I looked in the white pages, which we don't use these days anymore, but at the time you did. And there were 11 pages of Olsons. And I thought, no wonder the Scandinavians, you know, this is <laughs> just true. like home. No wonder that people stayed. <laughs> That's true. And I can talk about Minnesota because I grew up in Duluth, Minnesota. So oh, I, did you? I, oh, yeah. goodness gracious. I understand goodness gracious. that. Well, what led to uh, accepting the CIO position at Brigham, Brigham and Women's? Well, I got out of graduate school and, you know, when I got to graduate school, you know, a number of my colleagues were doing IT, you know, sort of designing the next generation of the electronic health record or figuring out how to represent medical knowledge. And so that's important, but not nearly as important as making organizations adopt it well, you know, doing great things and how organizational change was hard and management was hard. So I wound up going to a lot of classes at the Carlson School of Business while I was at the University of Minnesota, very uh, management centric, came out of there wanting an a interesting quasi-academic environment without being an academic and wound up at Arthur D. Little, you know, big consulting firm in Cambridge, which brought us out to the Boston area. And after a, a year, Rant began, was asked to run their healthcare IT consulting practice, which I did and really loved it. I mean, great people, smart people, et cetera. However, a long way to respond to your question. But, you know, a couple of years into that, my wife said, look, we've got one, we've got two little kids and we want a third and this is the wrong time. Uh, in our family's life for you to be gone three days a week or five days a week. And she was absolutely right. So I, I got to get off the road. The secondary is I've been dispensing lots of wisdom. You know, I'd walk in a room and I was this wise 31 year old consultant here, you know, still umbilical cord attached. Um, <laughs> and I, I'd actually never lived this wisdom. You know, so, you know, it's what, it's like r difference between raising a kid and reading about raising a kid. Right. There's a world of difference, <laughs> you know, on the two. So I so, said, well, I'll go try it. You know, maybe I'll, you know, take this job. It's local. You know, it's a great organization. Uh, you know, get me off the road and I'll give me a chance to do, to take the wisdom. So that's how I got, took the job early in 1988 as the CIO at the Brigham. Well, you were a CIO then, of course, Brigham and Women's uh, joined with Mass General to be called Partners, which is now Mass General Brigham. But you were there ultimately as CIO for Long roughly, time. what, yeah. 22 years? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what were the major changes during that time? I mean, IT really almost developed completely in healthcare during that time. How do you look back on that, John? And what do you think the major changes were during your time as CIO? Well, there were multiple, Gary, as you can imagine. You know, one is this extraordinary change in the technology. So, you know, when I first got there, you know, the personal computer was still new and the network PC was new. And we used to have committees looking at PC purchases, make sure they were astute, et cetera. So you move from the personal computer to the web, to the mobile device, to now AI. They say, golly, there's been extraordinary changes in the technology. You know, similarly, you know, IT in early 80 was still pretty much the back office, you know, just keep the, you know, throw coal in the boilers every morning, make sure the payroll gets done and the lab works and all that other stuff. And by the time I was done, it, it was pretty much a strategic asset where you really began to think about how to leverage it competitively and further very important strategic initiatives. And along the lines, you know, help the clinical systems, the electronic health record and decision support, et cetera, what took through leaps and bounds. So there's just been incredible progress in doing that. And I think the, you know, the taking a complicated organization like the Mass General, you marry it to another complicated organization, you get an even more complicated organization. So a lot of changes about how you manage, you know, very complex uh, organizations. Organizations and along the way here, it was this movement to value-based care, which you you know you've seen a lot of this sort of slow-moving glacier through the valley, but it's moving through the valley, um, and you began to see the real advent of measuring care quality and worrying about errors and how we're doing with populations. And probably last but not least, Gary is uh, you know professionally I became quite active, you know with hymns and chime and writing and things like that. Plus having three daughters who went from infants to uh, outstanding young women. You know, along the way here. So a lot of change, as you can imagine, in a 22-year period of time. Well, John, it started out, as you point out, back office. We're talking health IT, particularly in the health system, back office. You ended up really working with the CEO, the board of directors, CFOs. I mean, it became a very strategic kind of position. How did you handle that just professionally and personally, that growth in different focus over the course of the 22 years? Well, I think it was fortunate, like perhaps most folks who you talk to, Gary, I had some people along the way who shaped me. You know, Dick Nesson was my first CEO at the Brigham, and he was phenomenal at making sure we always remember why we were here, and that's the care of patients, et cetera. He was also phenomenal at taking extraordinary talent, giving them long leash, and if they stepped in crap, getting them out of there. Uh, Jim Mongan was a, an exceptional listener. So anyway, along the line are people who shaped you. 
and who wanted you to succeed and wanted to understand and were willing to take the time to go off and do that. And I think that plus, you know, having a, a developing a terrific network of colleagues in the industry. So you're learning all the time from the consultants and from the other CIOs and from other practitioners. So it's a grooming experience to, over the period of time. Uh, you become ready and quite fast and quite comfortable, frankly, at operating at fairly high levels with some, you know, pretty high stakes, uh, undertakings. You may have seen yesterday there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about let's break up the IT department and move it out to the various business units. As you pointed out uh, in a previous discussion, that kind of thought comes up from time to time. But what's really behind that and what's the value of thinking about uh, moving more of the IT function to the business units? It's kind of a blunt object response to a performance problem. And I think there's there's clearly no question, and people study that when you get a, an IT group and a business group that really work well together, they teach each other, they collaborate on plans, they hold each other mutually accountable for this is what you're going to do, this is what I'm going to do, etc. Um, that you can really do remarkable things when that that collaboration happens, and it's the same between a business unit and finance or a business unit and HR. You can get this to happen, etc. When it doesn't happen, you can have real problems along the way. So I think sometimes those articles are written because somebody says, golly, we're having a bear of a time with our IT group. They're unresponsive. They speak in weird language. We don't get them uh, and all this kind of stuff. And so the performance problem is let's disband them. I'll show them how to run it. Um, and, you know, it may or may not work. It's, it's got a high risk proposition. IT people don't necessarily want to work for business people. They want to work for IT people. Uh, and it does take a certain set of management understandings that you may or may not have. So I, I think you got to be careful with that kind of a blunt response to a performance issue. Well, then after 22 years, you accepted the appointment as CEO of Siemens Health Services, which mm -hmm. I think in one thing was a real uh, credit to you and the prominence and success of your career that you'd be offered that job. Looking at it from your standpoint, what were the decision points about your accepting that position, John? Well, Gary, I, you know, I have 22 years. So I sometimes would ask, you know, why did you stay that long? I said, well, one day at a time was interesting. You know, I just, I enjoyed it one day at a time. And all of a sudden it adds up to 22 years, just like that. It's like life in general, but also began to become bored and antsy and said, you know, I, I could do this in my sleep to a degree. And that's not fair to me and it's not fair to them. So I remember actually going to my boss, who is the chief operating officer, says, I'm bored. And he said, take a sabbatical. And I said, to do what? He said, I don't really care. Just get this out of your system. So, you know, at the time, and this was uh, late 2008, I knew the High Tech Act and meaningful use was going to pass. And I reached out to some colleagues who were at the federal government and health and human services who were going to create the regulations behind that. You know, what does meaningful use mean? What does it look like? And I said, hey, if you had me for a year, would that be of interest? He said, oh, come on down. We need all the help we can get. So I spent a year in the government working on the meaningful use rules and regulations and helping to distribute $37 billion worth of money. That was just really cool. Very exciting uh, time to be in the middle of all that. Anyway, my time with that was over. The rules were done. The money distributed, et cetera. Came back to partners and it was even worse. Uh, and by dint of timing, two weeks after I got back, a gentleman from uh, Siemens called and said, the CEO of the health services group uh, has left. Do you want the job? And 48 hours later, I called and said, sure, I got to do something because, you know, I'm going nuts. And I thought, what's the worst that could happen? You know, the worst is I get fired or I don't like it. You know, big deal. You know, those are quite recoverable, actually, you know, in, in people's life, et cetera. So I took the job uh, because, one, I had to do something. Second, it looked very interesting. It might be fun. The obvious question is compare your time at Siemens versus your time in a health system, what were the major differences other than the obvious, the purpose of the organization was different? I sometimes would get asked, what do you miss about partners? I said, well, I missed three things. I missed the mission. I really believed in the mission of research and education and community. And it's not like Siemens was ignorant of that. It just wasn't front and center, you know, what they were doing like it was at partners. So I believe in the mission of mission. The second is, you remember taking the elevator at the Dana-Farber, and in the elevator with me was a woman who, elderly woman with an IV pole who probably weighed 50 pounds. She was dying. And I thought, now, I remind her of why I'm here. This is why I'm here. You know, I'm not a doctor, but this is what we are all about. So you get reminded by the being proximal to care why you are here. The third is you get in these meetings with rocket scientists, and it's just really neat. Uh, now, you know, there's smart people at Siemens and very smart people at Cerner. 
I'll give you this example here. I, I write a letter to my family every week, and I have for 35 years, you know, usually three to four pages long, covering a range of things. And a couple of weeks ago, I wrote about the fact that diphtheria, you know, and which was deadly for young kids. And can you imagine as a parent holding an infant who's suffocating in your arms? Uh, and there's nothing you can do. Between the time diphtheria was named and the vaccine was developed was 92 years. How long did it take Moderna to design its vaccine? Two days. Yeah. Two days. Wow. And so you're sitting with people. That's what they're doing. And I said, this is just really cool. I mean, they're smarter than I will ever be by factor 10. Uh, but it's just really neat to go up and do it. So I miss that, even though, they're, again, they're smart people. And this and the other. On the other hand, what I don't miss uh, is the urgency. You know, we've got to get things done. There's, you know, there's competitive pressure. We've got to move. I like the urgency. I like the clarity of decision making. It's pretty clear, you know, you know, how to get things done. And we didn't waste a lot of time on a lot of committees to doing this. And I also liked that Siemens, in the case of the, to the global perspective, you had to think about systems in Australia and systems in the Middle East and systems in Europe. And that was just a very interesting perspective to happen, let alone the difference between an American academic health center and a German industrial giant. You know, there's obviously cultural differences that, that go with that. Uh, so anyway, it was, there was a, uh, both, there were both sides had some uh, features that were exceptionally attractive because they both had sides that were annoying. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a, um, enjoyed the, enjoyed the change. What about the difference between being a CEO and a CIO? How did you kind of react to all of that? And looking back on it, which did you like best? The roles were more similar than different. That's for sure. I mean, at the end of the day, in both, you have to say, well, where are we? Where, what is our strategy? What are we trying to get done here? And 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 strategies are hard. There's uncertainty in the environment. You don't know how you know competitors will react or this, that, and the other. So, what's the strategy? What's the plan to get there? Are we resourced well enough? Do we have the right fannies and the right seats to make this thing happen? And are we executing well enough along the way? Sooner or later, the train's going to leave the tracks and run down the gully, and so we got to dig our way out of a ditch that we've you know done ourselves for. You've got people who are really talent really good, but every now and then they stumble or they have aspirations of, anyway, it's all the same, you know, at a level, the same set of instincts that make you good at one, make you good at the other. And in both cases, you're accountable to somebody else. You know, you're accountable as the CEO to a board and to shareholders and et cetera. And as a CIO, you're accountable to a C-suite and the medical staff and, you know, your community, things like that. So you, you still have the, you're not a unilateral uh, agent, you know, so to speak here. Remember, Gary, one of the things we would say at Partners, and maybe you can see this other academic health centers, a 19 to 1 vote is a tie. Oh, for God's sakes. You know, <laughs> just a consensus-based model. I'd love to be back in the mission stuff. On the other hand, wouldn't mind importing the urgency. It wouldn't mind importing the clarity of decision-making, et cetera. So in a way, it's like asking, which of your children do you love the best? You know, I love them all uh, for different reasons. Uh, and in some ways, like your kids, if I could just fuse you two, uh, well, we'd have the perfect human being. But there you go. Uh, so I, I, anyway, I can't pick one. I'd like to fuse the two if I could. Yeah. Well, that's that's wisdom speaking, John. What was the toughest decision you made while you were the CEO at Siemens? Do you think? Well, I think the the hardest decision, and there were you know complicated decisions about you know do we fund a new product and will it do well in the market, and how do you sunset a product when people still depend on it, et cetera. And I my guess the the hardest decision, and perhaps the one I was biggest disappointment is I really wanted us to make a go at it at Siemens. You know, it had had a struggle over the years, and some bad decisions were made, and not that we were flawless because we had our own share of decisions that weren't so smart. But I thought, golly, we're going to show them how to do it within this Siemens. It's big and industrial giant, make MRIs and power plants, et cetera. And at the end of the day, that wasn't going to work. You know, that's not who they were. Uh, you know, we weren't moving fast enough in a meaningful use era. And so it was time to find, as we call it, a better owner. And as you know, Cerner became the better owner. And on the one hand, that's absolutely the right thing to have done for the customers and for the business and for the industry. On the other hand, golly, I wanted to make it work. And we didn't. We just weren't able to do that. And the whole Siemens operation built on shared med originally, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the yep. financial model that uh, was just an awesome, awesome financial product. It was, I'm sure, hard um, layer on the clinical side and then find that you, uh, you know, the better option was to sell the business. So that was a tough one. Let's go to data, healthcare data, which has the importance of it and the magnitude of it has changed a lot. Over the last 20 or 30 years, you were at the High Tech Act. You were right there at the beginning as 
as the regulations were being developed. Um, how do you view the importance of the High Act to digitizing medicine? Well, I think it was exceptionally important. I mean, it's, you know, I remember sitting in the halls of the Health and Human Services and you can see they had a board with one big S curve, which was at their time, the thought of here's, you know, the accountable care, you know, value-based care is going to have an S curve that looks like this. You say, well, if that's the case, you know, it's impossible to do value-based care really without a digital foundation. That's correct. So we actually have to precede this S curve of value-based care with an S curve of adoption. And that's why meaningful use came to be. And you say, did it, in fact, give the two-year, what it was supposed to do, a head start, three-year head start on laying the foundation? Absolutely. You know, we went from 10% of hospitals or numbers like that of using sophisticated clinical systems to 90% of physician practices, too. So it really, you know, laid the foundation in lots of ways. So thumbs up, accomplished. Um, it also elevated the role of the federal government in the healthcare IT landscape immensely. You know, largely before that, it sure would deal with HIPAA and a variety of other things, but now it was the biggest cat, you know, is the biggest gorilla at the table in terms of what was going on there, et cetera. Now, it created a or left some hang, what I call hangover issues. So, you know, usability is still an issue. Uh, interoperability is still an issue across the board. And I think, Gary, frankly, a lot of organizations said this is a mandate. I'm going to install it and check the box, you know, just so I get my check and I don't lose conditions of participation in Medicare programs. But what they did, never really did was to optimize use of it to improve care. They just, quote, installed it, you know, like installing new fixtures in your toilet, uh, et cetera. So I think there's some un, uh, untapped potential uh, in there. But nonetheless, there is a, you know, the, the federal government laid the foundation, exposed some secondary issues and elevated its role in the conversation. Interoperability is obviously a big issue. Um, I'm sure you all knew it. There's just a bunch of barriers there. No. Um, what's the time frame, John, do you think to uh, kind of resolve this interoperability gap, if you want to call it that? Will we yeah. see at the end of this decade, will we be through this or... What you're thinking? Well, I think, you know, as we've all seen in the 21st Century Cures Act, there were some provisions there that made it really, if you were, quote, engaged in information blocking, you got beat up uh, a little more severely than you might in, in the past and laying out certain eight, eight application programming interface standards, et cetera. But the other thing, Gary, I think we have to be a little bit more thoughtful and real about this topic. In no industry is there broad interoperability. End of statement. So sometimes we get into this conversation that, golly, and banking, I go anywhere in the world, use my ATM and get some money. And that's true. On the other hand, if, uh, if you were to go to your bank tomorrow and say, let's uh, Bank of America, whatever it is, say, I want 20 bucks. And then Bank of America says to Gary, you don't have it. You only got 10. But tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to reach into your other bank accounts, the one you have at Citizens and Wells Fargo, see what I could find. Uh, and if I find 10 bucks, I'm going to bring it back and give it to you. That does not happen. Why does it happen, not happen? Because the banks don't want it to happen. Why do they not want to happen? Because they don't want somebody to say, holy schmokes, Gary's got a lot of money. Maybe if I send him some, you know, inducements, he'll leave Wells Fargo going to come to Bank America. So in all industries, there are real limits to interoperability. You know, if you Hilton's best deals don't show up on Expedia, they show up on Hilton.com. So I think when you see it advance and in industry in, in financial services and travel, it is more advanced than in other industries. You see three things, one of which is focused on a limited targeted set of transactions, you know, extracting cash or in our case, prior authorizations, perhaps, or insurance claims, et cetera. So a very targeted set of transactions. Second, very clear business cases when there is a case. So people say, I'm willing to pay for that. You know, I'm, I do want to see that happen. Different from a use case, which is, that's cool, but you know, don't, don't ask me to cough up money for that. And the third is a body which brings all the players together that says, let's hammer out the details of standards, of capital investments, et cetera. And banking is swift is one of the organizations that does that. The Open Travel Alliance does it in travel. So will we ever see it in healthcare? We'll see it better. Will we have this sort of nirvana of free-flowing data everywhere? Not a chance uh, that that will happen. It's never happened anywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's a, we that's a well-reasoned uh, point. You mentioned usability. What about usability relative to doctors using the EHR What's the, uh, how will that unfold over the rest of this decade? Oh, I think it's a tough one here. I think there's multiple levers you can pull and are being pulled. Sometimes the design is crummy. So, you know, no wonder because it's confusing, et cetera. 
Uh, I do think there's some technology that can help, like we're making a lot of progress in voice recognition. So rather than type, you just talk. And there's really real progress in, in sort of leaving some of the, the interaction burden how that can go on. So we'll make technology advances. Sometimes it's because these things are poorly implemented. I mean, class, you know, as you know, class did a study once and found that for epic and certain customers, there are organizations that are happier than happy and organizations that matter than hell about the whole thing. And same system, you know, same server system on both, same epic system in both. Why? Well, it's, you know, training was good in one, not so good in the other. Workflow design, you know, all the stuff that goes with implementation. So, above and beyond design, say, did we implement it correctly? Did we train people correctly in this and the other? I think the, the third thing that we can do is be sanguine about the fact that how long would it take you to write a prescription on a, on a pad? Two seconds. How long is it going to take you on a computer? No matter how well you do it, 30 seconds. So, some things will just take longer. We're asking you to take a burden because we want clarity and decision support, et cetera. And then last but not least, Gary, I remember, you know, sitting in these meetings at Partners doing a design of our electronic health record. And we wrote our own for, you know, several different reasons. And I was remember listening to this committee of docs saying, well, we should, while we have them, why don't we have them do this? Let's ask, they should ask about smoking center. They should ask, are they safe at home? They should ask about this and they should ask about this. All these are really good things to do. In aggregate, they're lethal. And they just sort of, you know, overwhelm the doc. It's what I call the tyranny of large numbers of good ideas. It's just crushing. So part of it is let's pull some, let's take some burden off their plates. You know, some of the documentation is crazy. And why are you doing it when we could have someone else in the practice do it, et cetera? So part of it is just distributing the work. All of those have to play out to address the usability issue. Uh, and those, none of those are quick fixes. Right. For sure. Well, we've seen a lot about uh, AI <clears throat> machine learning and how that is being used or will be used in healthcare. What's your view, John? How will that unfold over the rest of the decade? How important yeah. is that? Will they be used both for clinical administrative uh, purposes? Yeah, I'm actually, uh, you know, finishing up a book with two colleagues on AI and healthcare. And so it's actually due to the publisher within 30 days here. So anyway, we've thought, thought a lot about this. Well, um, you have to, John, you have to come back and we'll talk about the book. So. <laughs> yeah, here's a special deal for you guys, yeah. hot off the press. <laughs> no, I think, Gary, a couple of things. One is it's kind of interesting when you look at the um, history of IT use by industry. About every 10 years, a technology arrives, it just changes the world dramatically. Uh, the mainframe in the 60s, the mini computer in the 70s, the network personal computers in the 80s, in the 90s, it was the web. You know, Amazon founded in 1994, Google in 1998, the mobile connected mobile device in the decade 2000, and the iPhone debuted in 2007. And you say, well, what's it now? And it's AI. Uh, and you say, but it's really early. So I don't, you know, you've probably seen, and maybe you're, most people listening have seen the Gartner hype curve, you know, the up peak of inflated trough of disillusionment and path of productivity. When they place various AI technologies on the curve, it's all to the left. It's all in inflated expectations. It's all in trough of disillusionment. There's very little in mature use. So we are early. And so it's really hard to work your way through all the issues like bias and black box and, you know, this kind of stuff here. Uh, we'll get through it just as we got through the Sinclair and the Osborne, all these rinky dink little personal computers way back when. So I think where we'll see it, Gary, we will see it fairly soon on the administrative side doing prior authorizations, helping with coding, helping with scheduling, et cetera. Why? Because there's not a whole lot of regulatory oversight needed here. The ROI is a little clearer. The AI machine learning is a little easier to get done, et cetera. The rollout on the clinical side of helping a doctor make a better decision or you and I make, that'll take longer because of regulatory and the complexity of it all. So nonetheless, these things take time to play out. This takes years to play out. And so you and I, you know, we'll have this conversation a decade from now and say, wow, you know, look at what's happened uh, in the intervening 10 years. But we might have a conversation in a month and say not much has changed in the intervening month. Mm -hmm. Well, you published recently an article in the Harvard Business Review, something about the five principles of yeah. consumer experience. Share with us, John, if you would, the themes of that article. I was at Chime, which is the healthcare CIO meetings. And uh, being a former CIO, listening to a number of my colleagues talk about what they call the digital front door you know, in their organizations. And basically it says, you know, we want to give a digital uh, setup whereby patients can find a doctor, schedule an appointment, look at the results, pay their bills, et cetera, uh, to sort of ease the experience, the consumer or patient experience, and, you know, perhaps catch up with what you have in other 
parts of our lives, like banking and you know, checking into flights, etc. So they were talking about the digital front door, and it's a smart thing to do. And I thought about that. I said, that's a smart thing to do. However, you got to think about five things, you know, as you go about this type of stuff. And that's what the article is about. Here are the five things I think you got to consider as you as your plans evolve here. One of which, Gary, and, and you've probably seen this too. In healthcare, we have their patients and their consumers. Right. People receiving care, people like you and me making decisions about breakfast, you right. know, or you know, what we kind of car we bought. And we keep the two separate. And I said, they're not separate at all. In fact, patients are always consumers and consumers are always patients. So as a patient, you make a decision. Do I take my meds? You know, do I do my rehab? Do I stay with the doctor? I'm making consumer type decisions. And as a consumer, you're making decisions about your health all the time. Do I get up and go running or not? What do I eat for dinner? You know, all this stuff here. So I think, you know, one of the things you got to be careful in healthcare is, is creating them as separate individuals, as separate personas. There's actually the same. So just be careful about that. So that's number one. Number two is you got to be careful about the term digital front door because we often take the first wave of IT digitization. You take a physical thing and you make a digital equivalent, but you preserve the name. Automated teller machines. Well, it's an automated teller is what that is. The electronic medical record. Well, it's a paper medical record, but it's electronic, uh, et cetera. And we've done the same with the digital front door. You walk into the hospital. You walk into the doctor's office. And I say, well, you got to be careful with the, with the label. Because if they apply that there's a physical structure, that may not be the case. You know, there may be at home. It may be walking around with a device on you. It implies that we will care for you once you ring the doorbell. We'll react. Well, you may want to, you'll always have to do that. But you might want to think about proactively all the time reaching out. Plus, you and I know this, it is more than the technology. It's the process change. You know, I really want the appointment with the doctor, not just the electronic equivalent. And a lot of this stuff is directed to the ambulatory practice, but it covers all experiences across the healthcare system that have got to go on. So basically, Gary, was these, these are the things I would encourage us to think about as we go into the next stage of whatever it is these organizations are planning to do in the digital front door. Yeah, it was a terrific article, easily readable. So congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. Uh, definitely a good one for uh, for all of us. John, let's turn to governance for a moment, if we could. You've sat on a number of boards and sit on a number of boards. What do you enjoy most about being a board member? Well, I think there's a lot of things, you know, one of which is you, you if you, you're working with some pretty talented people, you know, fellow board members, the leadership team of an organization who are trying to do pretty impressive things, you know, and overcoming some non-trivial obstacles. And that's just you know, sort of the team sport of working on complicated, meritorious challenges. That's always fun, you know, and that's been part of my career, your career, et cetera. And that's a sort of a way to go off and do that. So I really enjoy that part of it. The, the second is because you can be on several is you have different lenses into the industry. You know, there's for me a telemedicine lens into the industry. There's a measurement of quality lens into the industry. And so you can see this industry from multiple vantage points, which is just kind of interesting. Uh, to go off and to see. And the other is, you know, unlike the sort of nine to five day job, there's a lot more flexibility in terms of time. So, you know, you and I were talking about uh, for this about being grandfathers. Right. And so just time with grandkids, which is always fun to do or visit places on this planet that I haven't seen yet. I'm not sure I will, given the however long this pandemic lasts, but nonetheless, I wouldn't mind seeing more of it. So I enjoy the, you know, the, the same team element that's been part of my career, yours too, uh, but also the advantage of seeing lots of different perspectives. John, you've been both a management and obviously a board member. One of the big issues that I've always found uh, when I've been on boards is that balance between management, governance. Each of you have, each management and governance have swim lanes. How do you handle that situation, John? Well, it can be tricky, you know, Gary. I mean, at the end of the day, I think you have to remember as a board member that you represent some constituency. You know, your job is to represent the shareholders in a for-profit board and a partner's healthcare. Others, your job is to represent the community. So your no job is not to represent management or be their shill. Your job is to represent and make sure the interest of the shareholder or the interest of the investors or their community or they. So part of it is just to remember that. 
you know, keep that in the back of your mind. That being said, uh, you want to make sure if management is acting in accordance with that, that you are as supportive as you can be. You know, you're not, your job is not to get it done. It's their job to get it done. Your job is, first of all, given this, what are the legal things you have to do about compliance and make sure those things are happening, you know, so that you're protecting the interests legally and regulatorily of the you know, community you're serving. Uh, but it's to support those things and help as needed to help with guidance, with opening your Rolodex, whatever it might happen to be. You know, in some ways, you know, it reminds me of raising uh, uh, children uh, and raising, you know, particularly adolescent females, because there were times in the discussion with a daughter who's 15 or 16, you say, uh, I'm not so sure I would do that. Um, now, there's a fine line between when you step in and say, I'm your father. No, because I just think that's asking for huge trouble versus you got to learn, kiddo. You know, you got to go off and do your thing and I'll support you and I'll love you madly, et cetera. So there's always that kind of fine line at times where you say, you know, geez, management, your call, you're on the hook you know, whatever, uh, versus 100%. So anyway, there's a bit of a challenge. And at times you want to get in and run it yourself. That's not your job is to run it. That's their job to go off and run it. That being said, and I think good chair, board chairs can sort of slap your hand uh, when it's inappropriate. And good board chairs uh, can sit down with CEOs and other members of the board later on and say, hey, let's talk about how we you sort of get the balance back if we, you know, want it off a little bit. What are the characteristics of an exceptionally good board member, John? Oh, I think, Gary, they, a number of things. You know, there's the usual of any senior leadership person that they're bright, you know, they're honest, you know, they're direct, you know, they communicate. Well, all the things you'd want to see, you know, just regardless of whether board member or a C-suite person or mid-management level, you, you know, you'd want to see that and things like that. Uh, I think they bring something to the table that is clear to them and clear to the others. And that can be because they know a whole lot about a particular topic that's really important to us. Or they're about as well connected as anybody could possibly be you know, in the industry, etc. Or they bring a brand and a legitimacy, frankly, because they're on the board, this board must be, whatever it is, it's clear why you're, there's an asset uh, that you bring to the table across the board. I think, you know, other things you keep going on the list is, is they take the time to understand the company and what it does and its customers and the manager. So you say, I'm, I'm really going to learn a lot and I got to do more than surface learning. I got to learn. It doesn't mean I'm making widgets with the rest of them, but I'm in there learning. And the others, you're prepared you know, when you walk in and deal with issues and you're responsive, et cetera. So, you know, your job is to coach and support as needed, which means, you know, you got to, you know, be prepared, understand the industry, understand the players, uh, et cetera, and know when and how to respond across the board. In some ways, that's kind of a lot of what management does, you know, depending on your management style uh, is the, you know, all the above. John, this has been a terrific interview. I have one last question, if yeah. I could, and that is in our audience, there's a number of earlier stage or up and coming leaders. What advice do you give to up and coming leaders? Gary, I think there's probably three things to do, and these will sound a little intangible. One is always trust your instincts, you know, about this, that, and other. So, you know, when I got it mentioned before, when I got out of college, didn't know what to do. I didn't want to go to med school, didn't want to go to law school. And I thought, I don't know what to do. Uh, and I, but I'll, what the hell, I'm going to go hitchhike for a while, et cetera. So in retrospect, at the time, I thought, golly, I'm, you know, everybody else is so certain and I'm going to be the one who winds up on the trash heap here. But my instincts were that that was not me. And I followed that. And similarly, I got down to Panama and I said, you know, I'm madly in love with this woman. What the hell am I doing down here in Panama? <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm going to go be with her. It'll work out. So trust these instincts that you have. It goes with the second thing, which is understand who you are and what you believe to be true. And so there are certain things that you value. And like you know, part of our earlier conversation, I value the mission you know, and I value this. And I value understand that and understand how you learn and understand what you like and don't like. And so don't do things, you know, if you get away with you don't like. Last thing, Gary, is, and I've uh, talked this a couple of things, you know, at the end of the day, all of us pass away. Uh, and you say, well, if I had five minutes left and I wanted to look back on my life, what would I want to say about it? And you say, you ought to have that list. What do you want to say? And to make sure that any given day you're doing the things that help you say what you want to be able to say when that time comes. And sometimes you get asked, well, John, what would you want to say? I said, I want to say five things. I want to say that I'm as madly in love with my wife then as I am now. The second is that my three daughters will have had lives as blessed as mine. They've taken their own paths and God love them, etc. But they will be as fortunate as I've been. The third is that I've been spared crushing pain and poverty and bigotry, etc. And all the, all the crappy things that can happen to people. And if I'm not spared... 
at least I dealt with it, you know, with, with courage. And then the fourth is that the people who I work with will say I inspired them, taught them, and led them well. And then the fifth is that the industry I served and the organizations that I served are better because I was here. Uh, I'm not under, there's never going to be a plaque to me in some, you know, monument somewhere. That's okay. Uh, and if you can say those five things or whatever your list is, then you will die with a smile, et cetera. So those are the three things. Trust your instincts, know who you are. And, you know, it, you can't really develop that list when you're 16. When you're 36, you'd better be able to do that. Uh, and so that's what I would pass on to the folks who are listening and who have uh, terrific and brilliant careers ahead of them. John, great advice. We appreciate your time today. Uh, well done. Thank you, Gary. It's a pleasure. And uh, it's always good to see you. And uh, thanks for taking the time. I enjoyed it.